distinguished members of chennai center for china studies young minds participants and supporters of c3s warm greetings and good evening welcome to the c3s institutional dialogue on the topic china's civil military fusion with lieutenant general pr shanga the core objective of china's civil military fusion is to ensure that proper mechanisms and policies are in place to translate china's economic and technological achievements into military power president xi jinping has identified transforming the people's liberation army into a world class military and leading the world in emerging and disruptive technologies by 2049 as core national goals for china a key element of his plan for achieving this vision is a whole of government effort overseen by xi jinping himself called civil military fusion this strategy was elevated to a national strategy in 2014 where it seeks to increase interaction between china civil research and commercial sectors and its military law enforcement and defense industrial sectors a question that arises in everyone's minds is why should this be a subject of study for a think tank we have chosen this topic for two important factors one it forms a core part of china's military modernization and two it has got implications for regional security especially india due to the ensuing border standoff with china In today's talk, Lieutenant General P. R. Shankar discusses the civil-military fusion's underpinnings, current conditions, and the implications for India. To introduce our distinguished speaker for today, Lieutenant General P. R. Shankar is a retired Director General of Artillery. He is an alumnus of National Defence Academy, Defence Services Staff College, Army War College, Naval Postgraduate School, and National Defence College. He has held many important command, staff, and instructional appointments in the Army. He has vast operational experience, having served in all kinds of terrain and operational situations, which has confronted the Indian Army in the past four decades. He gave great impetus to the modernization of artillery through indigenization. He has deep knowledge, understanding, and experience in successful defence planning and acquisition, spanning over a decade. Projects like the Danush M777 ultralight howitzer, KN Vajra rocket and missile projects related to Pinaka. among several others projects came to materialization due to his relentless efforts presently he is professor in the aerospace department of indian institute of technology madras chennai where he is actively involved in applied research his channel gunner shot is very well recognized and received where the general writes regularly on defense and national security thank you very much sir for taking time out to be with us today with these brief words i request commodore rs vasan director general c3s to make his opening remarks over to you sir can't hear you sir or uh... connectivity issue uh sorry uh, can you hear me now yes sir we can i'm so sorry there is a brief uh, internet interruption Uh, good evening uh, our chief patrons uh, general shankar uh, air marshal rathman and all the dignitaries who are here today it's a great pleasure uh, for us to have general shankar talk to us today on this very important topic of uh, civil military fusion in china and uh, you know as i was teasing general shankar before the meeting started uh, he's gotten into the habit of writing one article after breakfast one after lunch and one before dinner to appetite for as an appetizer so but i know it it's been a invaluable addition to you know what he has been uh, writing on various facets of china and uh, you know uh, which are of such great relevance to uh, c3s as a think tank and to all the china watchers in india so his gunner's uh, shot has also become recently gunner's shoot because he he is very determined to shoot at uh, uh, you know our adversaries and he makes it a point to have all his facts and figures right 
before he can uh, you know cock his gun so coming to the topic you know my own exposure to the civil military fusion uh, goes back to the days when i was uh, directing staff in the naval war college for over two and a half years and that time as a ds you are required to uh, guide students on <coughs> so naval studies was china studies you know i'm talking about 93 to 96 when i was in uh, uh, naval war college and that time when we started looking at this exact uh, idea of uh, civil military fusion we realized that the army of that time thankfully it's not doing it anymore they were into running hotels they were running brothels it's all on record it's not to demean the pla but this is on fact that you know the, there was a lot of uh, uh, you know issues which were not uh, in national interest at that time there was course corrections applied later and now today it has become a professional army so uh, as bala has already highlighted the whole objective is to achieve a certain potential by 2049 so which is not far away from here but they are working to a plan and we know how uh, various facets of this fusion has taken place i know general shankar will uh, you know lay bare the entire uh, canvas on what the plans are how much have they succeeded and what more is being done and more importantly what can india learn from this because you know we have a culture of psus here you know which are delivering we have drdo and then we have of course the scientists and others and the bureaucracy who are not exactly working together which is why we find that uh, perhaps our own civil military fusion in terms of acquiring technology <coughs> is not at the level that china has achieved you know it is not g's invention by the way when you go back to the records you realize you know it started off with the cultural revolution itself and from the maoist time where some of the military factories were converted to making clocks or toys or something else to prove, provide them the, the the kind of economic uh, heft you know which will allow them to invest better also if you recollect in the in the last two years or so uh, usa came down heavily on all these efforts by the pla soldiers who are masquerading as phd scholars and getting into universities and the whole intention was again to get that kind of a technology back borrow steel or whatever you want to but they would like to possess this technology so there is a plan and i am sure uh, general shankar will look at all these plans on how china has succeeded in what's called the cmf for the china military fusion there is also a new term that they are using which is about military civil integration mci so which is which is nothing but but another modification so there are always questions on whether it's pla which is in the driver seat or which are it is the institutes and other factories which are in the driving seat and like us where we are looking at the psus china looks at the oems you know uh, and the state owned uh, state owned uh, enterprise so this is you know, there is a thin line between <coughs> the the public and the private uh, enterprise in uh, china but most of it is driven by pla and there have been phenomenal amount of analysis on this issue of cmf and i am sure uh, more than 68 people who are joined here will immensely benefit from <laughs> shankar's research in depth research that he has done on this topic of cmf uh, and uh, so without uh, taking away uh, his time uh, may i now request general shankar to go ahead uh, with the presentation there will be plenty of opportunity for question answers i would request the audience to kindly post them only in the chat box because we find that's a better way to uh, channel the questions to the speaker uh, later at the end of the session thank you and uh, over to you general shankar uh, thanks a lot sir thanks a lot for the talk uh, introduction and thanks a lot for your preamble to put the issue in perspective uh, i hope everyone can hear me yeah great <coughs> you know uh, a lot of people say a lot of things about uh, the civil military fusion of china uh, but fundamentally it is a very well drawn out process for the well drawn out process there is you will find that there is hardly any literature available on this subject which tells you exactly how they went about it right that's uh, something which i found very interesting sorry to interrupt general can you please be a bit louder sir please yeah can you hear me now yes a little bit louder sir thank you sir 
Yeah. Can you hear me now? Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, okay. Uh, <clears throat> for the kind of civil military fusion which uh, China has uh, undertaken, the amount of literature available on the subject is very low. In fact, hardly anything. The literature you find very surprisingly comes from U.S. Army sources and U.S. Uh, congressional sources. Why? The U.S. Congress, the U.S. government, and the U.S. Army feels U.S. Army means the U.S. Armed Forces uh, feel largely that the civil military fusion of China has stolen everything from USA. Right? But then it doesn't matter how, why they have done it, how they have done it and everything. The more important fact is that they have done it. Even that won't matter much to me. The more important thing for me is can we copy it? Right? And as to why we should copy it. With this, I'll, I've got a structured presentation because that gives, uh, giving you a, a presentation lens, uh, uh, cl clarity of thought as to what the whole thing was about. I'll open my presentation now. Yeah, you can see? Yes, sir. It's coming up. Okay. Yeah, you can see the uh, screen. It's yet to come up, sir. Yes. Can you please make it full screen, sir? Yeah, I'll do that. Thank you, sir. Yeah, we can see that now. Perfect, sir. Right, perfect. So we are now going to talk about uh, civil military fusion and what it's all about. China's obviously. What is the background? The first thing we have to understand is that China is not alone to have gone through the civil military fusion process. If you study the Industrial Revolution and the Colonial Era, it is all about civil military fusion. It is science, their technology then, you know, like invention of the guns, the arms, the ammunition, shipbuilding and all, which made colonial militaries better equipped, lethal and more efficient in expanding their colonies. It was their adventurism which took them all over the world. USA went through a process of intense civil military fusion during World War II. You know, at the peak of Second World War, it was producing military aircraft by the hour, tanks by the day, and ships by the week or even less. Such kind of transformation of uh, civil, uh, you know, cap capacity into military capacity has never been seen in the history of the world. American industry focused on churning out military equipment which could beat the Germans and Japanese qualitatively and quantitatively every second day. And they did it. And that's what actually ultimately defeated the Germans and the Japanese. There was a time when the Russian system was under almost collapse. And it was only the American industry which had, was uh, the backbone of the Allies' war effort. There was a time when Hitler had invaded uh, Russia and he was knocking on the doors of Stalingrad and Moscow. Even today, the military industrial complexes of uh, USA is all about military fusion. Lockheed, Raytheon, take anything. There's a whole lot of civil uh, military fusion involved in whatever they do. You look at NASA, their entire space program is fundamentally about civil military fusion. <clears throat> so the first proposition and the most important proposition is that civil military fusion is not making military strong, but it is about boosting economies to make nations great. And that is what we have to understand. In this century, the Chinese have started their process and they're seeking their way to greatness. And to a large extent, I think they have achieved what they have uh, started. That is why you see a hyperplane coming out, a hypersonic missile system coming out, their outreach into space happening, their ability to build their own Navy, which is now bigger than the US Navy has uh, in place. Right. What is our necessity? 
that is to me the most important question today right we'll decode what how china has done but we need to undergo civil military fusion to if we had to be a power of consequence right shedding our image of being a soft slow moving big talking status quo as nation of immense potential perpetually untapped if this image has to go the other way around we have to go through civil military fusion the psu route is the most inappropriate route we need to unleash our own potential but then civil military fusion is a complex process it's a very complex process as i realized uh, it uh, as i studied it i will keep telling you the uh, chinese model and i'll compare it with what usa also did in the last century because it is only these two which are recorded uh, processes of civil military fusion the one which happened with the european powers is not recorded that way but then what i realized is fusion strategy must suit culture and political climate you can't apply chinese methods here that is very clear now china's fusion is driven by its superpower ambitions and to establish a china based world order this was the underlying factor though today one of their vice premiers has said no no we don't want to be a china based world order we just want to live so that's due to different reasons why is the usa and the western world dissecting the china model because they want to kill it when they started realizing that they have been stolen they start they are now uh, yeah luckily uh, they closed the door as the rather the stable door as the horse was bolting they've caught the horse by the tail that is why huawei and zte are uh, getting hit left right and center and with that the whole 5g story is almost uh, you know getting rebalanced on a world international system right and china is not going to no more dominate everything right but the important thing like i said this model is available for us to adapt so let me look at this chinese mcf model <coughs> first MCF is China's national strategy to make PLA the most advanced military in the world which Bala had said earlier but the more important thing is it eliminates barriers between China's civilian research industrial commercial and military sector defense sectors right the <coughs> the strategy implementation is through domestic R&D and cutting edge technology to achieve military dominance and this is through theft which commodore wasan had said a lot of it is through theft they send students out they send military people out one minute hello so right through tech and to achieve military dominance people went out studied uh picked up technologies they worked with some of the best cutting edge firms in the world but all the while they were shedding the that technology back home and ultimately after getting some experience they have gone back from where they were sent to you know develop their own models now this is a mcf seeks accelerated military modernization through integration of new technologies with operational concepts increase scientific research and personal reforms the important thing is they even took operational concepts from western world and countries scientific research and personal reforms and all yes part of the deal but even operational concepts by being part of the think tanks and all that have gone back if you study the operational concepts of the pla today they actually mimic and ape the operational concepts which the usa had adopted in gulf war uh, the gulf wars and the kosovo campaign in fact the pla is modeled on that now we'll get back to the mcf the mcf infrastructure structure connects the military and civilian sectors it catalyzes innovation 
economic development that means the funding model also comes out of mcf it advances dual use technologies heavily especially those used for informatized and intelligentized workers why this emphasis on intelligence and informatized is they learned in these two gulf wars that the way forward is information and information and information backed by precision weapons <clears throat> so if you see their complete mcf the in some form is oriented towards command and control systems and precision weaponry and if you notice all their you know milestones which they have reached in the recent past and if you recollect it it hinges around these two what is their approach the mcf concept took root at the turn of the century before that they didn't have before that as commodore wasson said they had a different kind of mcf they were into brothels and drink, you know liquor and all that and lot of businesses the pla uh, around the turn of the century actually the whole thing started with hu jintao who started reforming uh, pla to what it is today right though not much credit is given to hu jintao and jiang zemin uh, they did a lot it is that edifice which xi uh, xi jinping has now taken it to a different level like i said china studied the models of usa and other developed nations it initially sought military civil integration by greater collaboration between the defense and the civilian sectors they said no no there should be integration and all but integration didn't make headway because of individual uh, you know tough battles there was no centralized control and organizational barriers between a civilian setup and a defense setup uh, stood uh, in between then the different there were differences between the party and the state the party had a different view and the state had a different view there are organ barriers so it didn't go anywhere now as late as 2007 china decided to replace integration with fusion i think this was a critical and a defining moment in the whole story of mcf so what did they do they took hammers and broke barriers to create fusion now <clears throat> that was where they had this whole of the nation approach which uh, bala was mentioning at the beginning mcf from conver from making pla to a, a mod, most modern uh, you know army became a mean for means for national development it became a means to bridge economic social uh, development besides security development so the first thing was it got elevated to something which it didn't start with it was no more the case that pla will become the most modern thing in uh, modern army in the world to beat the world by 2049 it became a fact that this mcf will propel china to be an economic power uh, with a huge amount of social development that is significant the converting this potential is important so in 2015 mcf was uh, uh, elevated to a national level strategy to build an integrated national strategic system and capabilities to support the goal of national rejuvenation it be just became bigger and bigger and bigger in the national thinking of uh, china and as it became bigger it became more encompassing and it became more driving to certain inherent goals in the system to make it achieve to be made achievable right <clears throat> now what is the organization this is this organization is important to uh, see now just think the overall management and implementation of mcf monitored and is monitored and managed by the politburo the highest body in the uh in the prc the state council including the national development and reform commission and the central military commission 
So the first thing is the you see if you look at the hierarchy of the uh, PRC, these three are the first, second, and third uh, in the order of merit and importance in their straight structures, right? <clears throat> and it is these three which have been first fused together as far as MCF is concerned. But then they put it under the CMC, where a Central Commission for Military Civil Fusion Development was established. Now, it is headed by Xi Jinping, along with the Premier. These two people head this whole story. So any case for civil military fusion has to go to these two people. If there's no fusion happening in a particular sector, tomorrow Xi Jinping might ring you up and say, partner, what's your problem? Then all your problems vanish after that. That's the way it has been run. And that is why fusion takes place. Fusion, fusion by, you know, <coughs> definition happens from an external force. It doesn't happen, you know, by internal fusion. Fusion drives people together. So the fusioning force here very clearly is a political force. The most powerful and people and the organs of the state own and implement MCF as if there's no tomorrow. That's the, the grassroots level. Just think of it. Atma Nirbarta is our you know, Prime Minister's uh, clarion call. How many people own Atma Nirbarta and make it happen? We still want to import. We still want someone else to come and do this for us or X, Y, Z. Of course, this is as of today, maybe four, five years down the line, uh, hopefully a lot of things will change. Because if a person who's as powerful as our Prime Minister uh, has given this clarion call, we need to also give it time to happen. But at the same time, uh, I'm just highlighting this to put across a certain point. This special arrangement works to lay down directors for MCF and it overcomes any impediment to its implementation. <clears throat> this is important. It is not important just to lay down some guidelines for fusion, but there would be implement, uh, impediment to implementation and that is being overcome by fusion and the way these people are handling the whole story. Right. <clears throat> MCF fuses China's economic, social and security development to strengthen all instruments of national power and to achieve a world-class military. It is a dual tone of this whole story. <coughs> it involves development and acquisition of advanced dual use technology for military and civil applications. The fact that it does is reflected in the uh, hypersonic uh, vehicle test which they took, in which China has very clearly beaten USA to it. How good or bad it is is a later day story, but the fact that they could put up something, make it fly at hypersonic speeds and get it down to earth with some degree of control, even though it landed 30 kilometers away, is something. It's a, all this, if you look at it, involves cutting edge technologies in materials, it involves cutting edge technology in propulsion, it involves cutting edge technology in control and guidance systems, materials, new materials, all this could only happen if there was a high degree of civil military fusion. <clears throat> and then, of course, you're looking at reform of the national defense, science and technologies industries to meld them into one. Okay. <coughs> Let me get into a few nuts and bolts about MCF. We've spoken of the whole of government approach in their organization. Now, it has six facets. It fuses defense and civil technology and industrial base okay that means there is no difference between uh, you know something like drdo and csr or csir you have to fuse them if i give you a, give an indian equivalent you can't have a, 
you know uh, OFB uh, standalone or a defense PSU standalone from a normal PSU. So that has they fused that, and they had a whole lot of them. Now science and technology in innovations are integrated and lever leveraged across military and civilian sectors. Communication. Just take communication. Yesterday only there was a thing called the Antrix deal, and there was deal which was uh, you know uh, set aside by the court, and our FM came out and gave whatever a political thing. But at the heart of that, it was all about communications. Yet in India, we did something. You know, the space sector did it on a standalone mode without taking the military into the equation. Or if they did, it was only peripheral in nature. If only our space arm and the defense arm sat together and decided what to do, maybe the Dantrix Devils deal would have benefited the nation. It didn't. Whereas that is how a company like Huawei almost took over the 5G uh, infrastructure of the world. Now, in this, military and civilian expertise and knowledge are blended and talent is cultivated across the board. Right? <clears throat> then, civilian infrastructure and construction is leveraged for military purposes by building them into military requirements and standards. The classic case for this in the entire uh, you know, uh, MC of, of China is that railway line into Tibet, Gormo Tibet uh, railway line or the Gormo Lhasa Gormo line, which is done over permafrost technology. Right? It caters for all military requirements and it caters for complete Tibet the way it has transformed Tibet. And of course, civilian services and logistics are used for military purposes. We are seeing that happen across the LAC, where they are now building runways to increase their air capability, where they use leverage technology used in the uh, uh, you know railway system to adopt to the runways and adopt to the underground uh, facilities which they are being, which are they're creating. I mean, I'm, I'm giving you examples which are very easily available, uh, which you, we can relate with. They're using the same kind of uh, shipbuilding capability to make militia fleets and uh, civilian fl fishing fleets, which are flooding the South China Sea and uh, at Earlier it was at Paracels, now they're shifted to... Uh, earlier it was at Spratlys, now they're shifting to Paracel down south in the Natuna Seas. <coughs> All aspects of economy and society are utilized for mobilization of resources and capabilities for the defense of the nation. So these six facets are very clear amongst them. They have ensured redundancy and overlap with others. There are domestic and international dim dimensions to this whole story. We know that Huawei and ZTE are the two things. They, have, they, are, they their presence in India uh, would have probably today been much more, but for that Galwan happening. To a large extent, I mean, it is my personal opinion now. If Galwan had not happened. And, you know, we didn't have to suddenly one day face China across the LAC. We wouldn't have known what was happening to us. And all these Chinese firms, if we had not, you know, banned those uh, Chinese apps, and we had not uh, rather kept China out of our, uh, lot of our deals, one form of the other, if we had not allowed... If we had continued to allow China bidding for contracts here, we would have been in tremendous problems because everything was loaded with this fusion process of coming and building your infrastructure with the whole idea of knowing what you are. That is the reason why, you know, you're, if Huawei and ZTV were here, all your information and data would have gone back to the Chinese 
without even now it might still be going but it is a tougher process now implementation is from the highest national level establishments and organization and it goes down to provincial and city level units that's the kind of integration they have spoken of right i mean just think of an integration which goes down from delhi to a factory in trichy it's so much then then financial structures and regulatory mechanisms have been put in place to incentivize civilian and military stakeholders everyone has a stake and this is one thing which is great about uh, the chinese system it people call it corrupt but the incentives to be corrupt are huge in the system and the incentives to succeed are also huge in the system so if you succeed through corrupt means you are best incentivized and that is one of the reasons why china has grown now local governments academia research institutions private investors and military organizations are all included in this ncf and they have a exclusive focus on disruptive dual use technologies and systems call it ai today they china bets on ai what ai is going to do it is futuristic aspirational no one knows but they're betting big on it they're betting big on cyber technologies i re- read a article very few a few days back about a set of young chinese who are so gung ho about themselves for the kind of disruptive technology use uh, they're putting things to it's actually scary when you uh, listen to these uh, in interviews and talks but that's the potential they have uh, put together now if you look at it what all is there otherwise i've just put it on go through it improve efficiency capacity flexibility of defense and civil manufacturing increase competitiveness that's important so it is not as if the whole thing is you know there no competitiveness like h who again i'll get back a few examples who are we and zp they are almost they do the same thing but with greater competitiveness since they are two entities doing the same thing there's competitiveness and there's progress <coughs> and they also break the monopolies of soes zp and who are we are all pla funded firms but run on private lines completely okay then advanced self reliance in manufacturing key industrial technologies equipment and materials to reduce its dependence on imports including those with dual use that means self the, their own version of atmanirbhata strengthening and promoting civil and military r&d in advanced dual use technologies and cross pollinating military and civilian basic research this is very fundamental if you have a look at it it actually astounds me as to why we don't do it we have achieved great progress in space sector we have great achieved great, uh, great progress in the missile sector both basic technologies are the same but their research and everything is separate it is almost a duplicated form of research and just think who was the one person who integrated both of them at some point of time was dr abdul kalam he brought the technology from isro into r&d uh, drdo and kick started this and unfortunately we have grown apart of course there would be some amount of uh, uh, you know lateral thing but not the way it is supposed to be <coughs> right they also is promoting and sharing of scientific resources expanding the institutions in world in defense research very important we cannot expand the institutions involved in defense research we are sunk we are at that stage we have iits our iit structure has improved or nit's second rung are also in- increased 
but we are not expanding these institutions to involve them in defense research whereas microsoft and amazon they take these these very institutions they are using for their research so that mean means you need greater collaboration between defense and civil research communities which is not there we are exclusive they foster new type of research institutions with mixed funding sources important lean management structures dynamic efficient and effective then they factor military requirements and dual use purposes into building civilian private and public transportation infrastructure such as airports port facilities railways roads and communication networks everything has a is militarily purposed right the only time we could think that you know uh, uh, a four lane highway or a six lane highway is militarily purposed it became politically purposed also to showcase a particular state's capacity to build a road way where the airplane can take off a thing like this you even pakistan has done uh, across the border by widening their you know highways at places to enable drone operations and this they did about 10 years back <coughs> okay it includes infrastructure projects in dual use domains such as space and undersea as well as mobile communication networks and topographical and meteorological systems how many times have we heard of survey vessels coming into the andaman nicobar and carrying out topographical met uh, based uh, you know reconnaissance civilian vehicles they are doing military work but this is the way when the thinking has to change we blend and cultivate military and civil lsnt expertise through education programs personal exchanges and knowledge sharing cultivate talent through excessive talent recruitment plans and improve human capital and build a highly skilled workforce very important without a workforce you are going nowhere yeah this is more interesting they recruit foreign experts to provide access to know how expertise in foreign technology that means if there's a great guy sitting in you know norway pay him three times the amount and take him to china and make him build everything is can we do it yes we can and we have done it but it is in isolated pocket you would have heard of this solar economy uh, explosives they have one of the biggest hmx factories uh, uh, in the world i mean in this part of asia right most modern so economic explosives went brought the best known hmx uh, uh, expert in the world brought him here paid him two times twice what his government was paying made him build this factory and today they are one of the biggest explosive manufacturers in this part of the world can do it it's there with us then of course they reform military academies national universities and research institutes and tap into national wide nation wide patriotic uh, education programs which is par for the course harness civil public and private sector resources to improve B- pla's basic services and support functions so when we talk of you know cut feet to tail ratio and all that they have done it long back to this military civil fusion a lot of the logistics comes from the civil sector so they outsource non military services which were previously performed by the pla so even we could do that so you lean down your entire structure it this is something which has to be driven by the armed forces <clears throat> construct a military logistic system that is able to support and sustain the pla in joint operations and for overseas operations this entire bara is only to support and sustain the pla when i say pla all arms for the pla all over the world it also provides pla with modern transportation distribution warehousing etc 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 so pla gets a logistic system that is more efficient higher capacity higher quality and global reach and that logistic system is sold to the world 
for everything. It is not only it gives PLA a, a more efficient logistic system. The logistic system itself is sold to the world because then they have a logistics model for the world, right? So you see whatever the last one integrate state emergency management systems into the national defense mobilization system to achieve a coordinated military civil response during a crisis. Even disaster management is repurposed. Right? Leverage economy and society to support China's strategic needs for international competition. So if you look at it, they have touched upon every single aspect of life. It's a reordering of the way they do their business. There is no difference between what they're doing for the armed forces and the government. They both feed off each other. Right. What are the linkages? I mean, the linkages, they find, how do you do it? At the apex level, all the ministries, defense, foreign affairs, education, science and technology, IT, and their subordinate establishments are linked. They are driven by this one edict, civil military fusion. Whatever they do for the military is for the civil and whatever they do for the civil is also open to the military. Period. All military organizations are linked. Provincial and local governments are linked. Completely. There is no... So everything is subordinated to the other. We also started this Tamil Nadu Defense Industrial Corridor and the, you know, the uh, Defense Corridor in the North. Where are they? They're supposed to do this job. Then state-sponsored educational research uh, institutions, research centers and key laboratories are all linked. Try linking the CSIR with the DRDO. Both will cry and they'll defeat the whole purpose. Right? Just try linking our DRDO with the PSUs. They'll fight within two days. Students studying abroad, especially in disruptive technologies. This is what Commodore Watson had said. Right? Then, of course, major defense SOEs, other SOEs, companies like Costco, China National Offshore Oil Company, major construction companies which have roles in DRI projects, and all those companies which are part of the South China Sea artificial islands, they're all part of this MCF. Then, any private company which specializes in unmanned systems, robotics, AI, cybersecurity, big data, have all been incorporated into MCF. They know they are part of a system which will incentivize them if they are successful. That is the thing. For them, success is guaranteed. If they have to come out with the goods. Right? Now, MCF efforts involve partnership between central, provincial or city government. Right? It, they also link military district departments. It's, some, it's a huge network. I marvel at it as to how they've been able to put through. I mean, and fundamentally, it has probably been possible because of the, uh, the linkages of the communist government. Then, provincial and local governments have MCF industrial plans, and they have 35 national level MCF industrial zones, where every product which comes out of it has got a dual use purpose. They have investment funds by central and local governments and private investors who fund MCF. <clears throat> okay, let's look at what can we do. Can we do it? Sure, anyone can do it. But then the way I look at it, the Chinese model is too, uh, too messy and autocratic for our democracy. You know, we are looking at a democracy where we can put through three farm laws, right? And uh, we had to repeal, get, take them back. So it's too, too tight. But then the necessity of civil military fusion is undis undisputed. But then the first thing which we need, if you want 
civil military fusion, you need strong political will and the inclination to do so. That is mandatory. And that desire is evident in the Atmanirbhata program. Call it Make in India, Atmanirbhata. At least we have a, the Prime Minister who talks of this. But this has to percolate down to the last guy who has to be made to believe in this. Right? Like I said, it must be driven by a unitary political leadership backed by bipartisan con uh, consensus. Not like us. You know, here everything is political of one man at friendship to get the next seat. It needs a whole of the nation approach. And we need to, you know, stay the course for a decade. The entire process has to be self-driven and irreversible, like our economic reforms of the 90s. Whatever happened in the 90s was because of a necessity. And that necessity became you know, irreversible. And so we have continued with it. Something like that, if it happens today, right? And if it triggers off uh, civil military fusion, it will stay. So can we make that happen? That's a challenge in some form. Okay. <clears throat> right. Civil military fusion is not only about dual use. Like I said, the most important factor in civil military fusion is breaking barriers and establishing linkages with multiple channels of communication. You need to eliminate barriers to achieve fusion and not integration. In India, everyone believes in one-upmanship one and working to his concept of national interest. This is one problem which we, I feel we'll have. And this is my experience. When you go take a case, just take a normal case for you know buying radio sets uh, to the government of India. You go through 10 layers to buy one radio set. Now, in each layer, every fellow has got his concept of national interest. And when you see these 10 concepts of national interest up the chain, you wonder who, which interest are we, am I working for? And I get the feeling that I'm, I've been anti-national all the while. And people make me feel so. This is how a system works. And I'm giving you a very, very honest thing. Because when I was making a DE, I, I, getting one proposal approved by the uh, Defense Acquisition Council, there was well, the Lieutenant General I was sta standing in front of them and briefing them. So there was a person from there uh, who said, look, this proposal of yours, this uh, this particular line, you know, doesn't look, uh, uh, appear to be in the best of national interest. And I had to look on my shoulder. And I had to look at the Ashoka pillar I was wearing on my you know, shoulder as a lieutenant general. The only person who caught on with this at that point of time was Mr. Manohar Parikar, who told that person, he says, look, you've spoken of a, a national interest, that what the general has said is against the national interest. He's looked at his shoulder where he's wearing the national interest, so we'll give it to him. This is the thing we need to think of. Now, of course, inter-service, inter-department, inter-ministry, inter-state, inter-party, and myriad other inter-service barriers are calcified to the nth degree. How do you break them is a question mark, big question mark. So, if you want civil military fusion, we need an empowered structure and a well-defined hierarchy to break these walls with a hammer. We need clear-headed political leadership and unshackled military. Today, our military is very we're totally shackled. And a bureaucracy which sets its lassitude. You need politico-military bureaucratic fusion. If you don't do that, nothing will come. Okay. <coughs> I said it is impossible to create and sustain the Chinese model. But we can do something else. You have a clustered approach and incrementally achieve it. Don't try for that mega model like China. It's only the communists who can do it. And that to Chinese communists, not our communists. Not our communists who ruled Bengal and took it back by 50 years or 
for uh, you know who kept uh, educated state like kerala where it is you need successful and key sectors of national importance like defense space atomic energy and communications put them in cluster so that is one way you cluster this success cluster success stories drive their everything together that means a defense ministry a space ministry atomic and a dae uh, energy and communications have to sit together under the prime minister or whoever and work to one common purpose for each other other ways you have a disruptive and modern technology cluster like ai cyber robotics unmanned new materials and so on make various parks for them make give them dual tasking because the, all these are dual taskable technologies and use them unmanned systems you will need for so many purposes today in the nation and repurpose them for military uh, at least let the technologies prosper and once you have the ai parks and cyber parks and robotic parks we can but i been requesting so many people for the past 3 to 4 years to start a park on this no i have found no response then of course infrastructure and logistics rails roads ports warehousing freight houses transportation all this can be put in one you can do a whole lot in financial fusion we keep asking how is it that uh, you know if you don't have enough budget right a defense budget is low you don't need low high defense budgets to run your army if you do proper civil military uh, fusion you can do financial fusion also and financial fusion will offset the requirement of uh, you know government funding to a large extent you let the market pay and you defy your payments and that's the model which china has done it's a beautiful model then of course conventional bread and butter technology goods manufacturing where dual use can be exploited should be used there nothing very great about it right but it includes concerned ministries military department academies ya yeah, psus public sector industry drdo csir labs science and technological institutes and industry icons and more all these chaps have to come and into their respective clusters you need to focus on key technologies products and key personnel and you need talent retention and capture both are important today this talent capture and retention is being done abroad right and what is not said in this is you need leadership without leadership we are going nowhere a leadership which can think this manner right like i said <clears throat> it's foolish to think that we can do what china has done we cannot do what usa did in the last century that was a completely capitalistic model but they did it it is not as if the capitalistic model cannot do mcf and it's only the communist model will do mcf it's not so we can do it the way we want it so this is what i've had to say about civil military fusion uh, i am prepared to take on any questions uh, yeah, i am ready thank you sir my colleague ms sapna will take on the questions from yeah. the chat box over to you sapna thank you sir good evening all uh, so now we are going into the test and answer sessions I'll be reading out each question from the chat box. The first question is from uh, Shonik uh, Nivargi. Uh, Sir, do you feel we have insulated the armed forces and defence matters from society in general and industry in particular on the fear of lapse of security? And the second question is: With greater understanding of a security <coughs> matter, enable better civil-military fusion. uh yeah thanks a lot for that question the first and foremost uh the the 
you know separation between the civil and the military uh, was a thing of uh, is a thing of the past say about 20 25 years back there was no much not so much discussion about the military in the uh, civil you know establishment and i go with it it's not so for the past two decades things have changed a lot of things have started uh, flowing and today the interaction between the civil society and the armed forces is more the interaction between the civil industry and the armed uh, forces is more and we have a reasonably vibrant uh, private industry private defense industry uh, as against uh, uh, a monopolistic uh, you know, public defense industry we also have a vibrant uh, civil industry which can take on the mantle beyond what it has the capability is more overall so yeah maybe 5 years back 10 years back maybe 10 15 years back uh, your question was valid that we might not we, we were not in a position to a position to attempt military civil fusion not today today we can that's why i said that's why i have dwelt on what we can do rather than just going with what china is today we are in a position that we can do the very fact that i am trying to talk to people and i see a whole lot of students attending this topic this is not to give you a bashan about what china has done the more important thing is to what we can do for ourselves yeah next question thank you sir the next question is from bal <coughs> subramanian uh, the question is in 2020 trump banned chinese students coming to the us based on the studies and civil military fusion what role does these students researchers play in national development of, of, of china and what can india learn from this and do towards building our own comprehensive national park yeah <coughs> that's a very fundamental thing china didn't have the kind of knowledge say 20 25 years back uh china was not a knowledge society even now it's not a fully knowledge society so what did they do they sent uh, their students out those are not only students even the pla personnel they, as students they went out and they studied all these technologies and they were not parochial to any one technology they, they, though they focus on a few technologies they went in for everything they learned in fact let me put it this way Uh, in 2017 my son graduated from the university of irvine he got a phd there in software engineering right and uh, i was uh, there for his graduation 50% of the phd's gra- who graduated that day were from china across all disciplines in comparison the number of indians who graduated were about 5 or 6 and we are talking of a hall full of students that's a difference that's a kind of investment they did <clears throat> and the normal thing was all these people worked worked there after that and at some point of time they start going back to china and when they go back to china they go back to a specific institute where based on what their portfolio is they get an equivalent mirror job out there and in a mirrored kind of a uh, i want to society uh, uh, an establishment which does something and takes value out of it so it's a plan it's a deep rooted plan right <coughs> which was put into effect and they did it well today they have come to a stage probably when they can say to help with such thing because they have developed their own education system right and they are doing well but here again i'd like to juxtapose this fight of in spite of whatever we talk about our education system the western society still comes to india to take students we our people are welcome there with red carpet 
right and uh, into all kinds of technologies and we are not able to get one technology back it is a failure of our government i am not even saying that you know get them back and give them jobs and all we just get technology we get understanding with these societies where our students where our nationals go and they are doing and contributing to their society yeah this is my take okay, so uh, the next two questions are also from bond in fact this is a very important part of civil military fusion for us getting technology and talent back i won't say talent back just getting that fundamental what is a juice sort of its system yeah Yes, thank you. So the <laughs> next two questions are also from Mr. Bala Subramanian. The first question is: uh, In your talk, you have mentioned uh, ordnance <coughs> factories are not a way to go ahead, go ahead with civil military fusion. But we have also seen private entities like Reliance Naval who have failed miserably, putting national security at risk. <coughs> What effective model do you suggest? See, in any democratic society. where you want to free yourself of everything there will be uh, success cases and there will be failure cases also right the i mean if you know how the naval or other the reliance naval uh, program failed it was based on speculation that's why it failed it wasn't based on expert and knowledge systems many of us who were in the who had some idea of this entire deal knew it was going to fail right and uh, more than me i'm sure the naval personnel here will agree to what i'm saying it was speculation it was opportunism it was uh, you know favoritism also to some extent political favoritism across the board across the board so so these problems are endemic in our thing right so we have to live with it our ordnance factories failed because they allow we allowed them to grow uh, roots too deep right and those those uh, deep roots were detrimental to the system that you couldn't shake the tree at all right so that's how it is it's good that today you have broken the ordnance factory board down to seven constituents let's see how it goes forward right yeah the next question from mr bala subramanian is um can you please share where do different corridors stand in the civil military fusion complex and how are the different <coughs> corridors performing in your view see uh, the defense corridors Uh, have a huge role to play in civil military fusion right having been associated with the tamil nadu defense corridor uh, there is no two ways about it because the defense corridors you know is one of the smallest bricks where you have small scale industry you have bigger industry you have tertiary industry you have the knowledge of uh, you know, local uh, academia then you have startups the defense industrial corridor can do everything it's a small it, it it can make this world of civil military fusion the it is also because it's a state driven uh, you know corridor for example the tamil nadu defense corridor it is of tamil nadu and it is backed by the central government so there is fusion and then this tamil nadu defense corridor has got its nodes at various places so it has gone down to district level so it has linked these three it has got an academic partner or a set of academic partners all over it has got startups it has got everything then it has got funding models then the uh, tamil uh, i mean a government a state government uh, also has the ability to bargain with people to come and set up uh, systems for example uh, the ford factory in say chennai ford didn't come here uh, on its own the tamil nadu government bought it brought it here or for that matter hyundai right or for that matter tamil nadu government has also bid for uh, tesla to come up here if the tamil nadu uh, defense corridor has to succeed so tamil nadu government should go to 
some major players and say, why didn't you come on set up at, uh, you know, uh, research institutes here? Why don't you come and set up uh, some uh, factories here? Why don't you come and set up some uh, repair facilities here, MNR facilities here, maintenance and repair stations? A whole lot of things. So you can do a, the, in fact, Tamil Nadu, I mean, I won't say Tamil Nadu, any defense industrial corridor will take you towards uh, civil military fusion. Has it been done to some extent? To some extent, yes. But have we, uh, uh, are we anywhere near realizing the value of it? Sorry. And of course, unfortunately, for the past two years, COVID has uh, taken its toll. And that is a major thing because for any starting system, like this whole system of MCF in India is startup. It's a huge startup by itself. So at the very beginning of both these corridors, we've been hit by COVID. So our startup is stuttering. Luckily, since it involves the UP government and the Tamil Nadu government, let's see, hope it uh, gets some, uh, you know, legs back when the COVID wanes. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> next question is from C. Gopinath. Question is, China's political system allows complete control of the civil and military sectors. So fusion becomes possible. In India, where the government's control of the private sector is limited, what do we have to do different, <coughs> differently? See, that's why I said we can't have whatever China does. That's out of question. We have... The way I said is you cluster it. Take I given you those five four or five methods of doing it. At least club the logistics. Club uh, your successful sectors. I mean, for me, it's always a matter of. I've been thinking and thinking and thinking. Why don't we club our defense, your missile sector, your space sector, your DAE and energy sector and electronics. If you club these four five. And they are all successful. No? All of these are successful. Nothing is unsuccessful in this. We have got successes. At least reinforce success and make a model for others to think. It doesn't happen. Yes. Okay. That's the challenge. That's a political challenge for us. It's an, for us, it's not a matter of capability challenge. The challenge is political in nature. The next question from, is from Colonel Hariharan. The question is, don't you think lack of national vision is at the heart of our problems? And vision building is a regular exercise in successful global companies in our own country. So why can't the government do it and forget about politics? Does the various arms <coughs> of the government have a common vision? Yeah, that's a good question, sir. Uh, that's the That's one of the core problems of uh, the nation. Look, uh, to give credit uh, to our Prime Minister, he has coined this term of Atmanirbharta and it has got some traction. And uh, what from what I hear, that there are a lot of work being done. In fact, this is what one of my uh, youngsters who's in, who's today in the civil sector tells me. He says there's a lot of investment being done. I mean, when I say investment, not funding investment, but there's a lot of big issues being invested into, which is going to reduce our dependence on China. And how is that dependence going to be reduced on China is on various uh, sectors. There's right now, the dependence on China or the trade with China is going up. But there will come a day when that whole thing will start sink, uh, shrinking. I'm waiting for that day. That means we have achieved a certain amount of uh, unity in thought and as to where we have to go. And that will probably mark the day when certain amount of civil military uh, fusion also starts. And that will also be the day when uh, politicians are convinced that if they want to do a thing, they can do a thing. I mean, more than that, I don't know how we can change our politicians to think the way Chinese politicians think. I mean, I, I'm as good or bad as your guess, sir. Yeah. The next question from C. Gopinath. 
How did the capitalist model achieve the fusion? <coughs> yeah, if you see <coughs> how the capitalist model achieved the fusion, you have, you have to go back into the uh, you know the socialist or the uh, socio cultural setup of USA those days. USA in the period from say nineteen hundred to nineteen forty was an isolated nation. It was an isolated giant which grew on its own. There were inventive people who had gone there, people of ed who were involved in adventure. It was a it was a nation of immense resources. There and these immense resources had to uh, be exploited. And for exploiting all these resources, they were very inventive and they had to do and so they relied on education. And there were a capitalistic model, everything was for profit. So it became a self-sustaining thing where everyone uh, started growing that way, right? And when that system, it was like a sleeping giant, was touched after Pearl Harbor, the whole nation said, look, we're going to do whatever it takes to defeat uh, Germany and Japan. As simple as that. So a huge collective capability, it exploded on Germany and Japan. Till then, uh, you know, it was only Britain who, uh, who was, you know, anchoring these allies. And if you see that uh, here, the, you know, Japanese admiral who conducted that uh, thing on Pearl Harbor, he finally said, he says, we've woken up a uh, sleeping giant, right? And uh, it's going to come back on us and it proved costly to them, as simple as that. Again, it is situation specific, but what USA learned from that is important. It built a military industrial complex, which today till date rules the world. Okay, that is more important. They, they, they learned a virtue out of a necessity. Yeah. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> the next question is from Advocate Aisha, um, Aisha Vashishta. The question is, what is the point of view of Indian Armed Forces towards MCF? What is the use? What is the view? View? Oh, yeah. I don't think uh, Indian Armed Forces have reached the stage where they can start thinking of MCF. I don't think India, Indian Armed Forces uh, have, I've never, I mean, look, let me be very honest with you. I've never heard anyone in the Indian Armed Forces speak of MCF. Even I never spoke of MCF till I came out of it. I have started learning about MCF in the past four or five years. Right? So, uh, so Indian Armed Forces are, to be very honest, I think in a very, very infantile stage as, a, as far as MCF is concerned, right? Our thinking has to change. That's how it is. We have a long way to go. We have a long way to learn, actually. It's never too late to learn. Yes, sir. the last question is from Mr. Atreya. The question is, how is civil-military fusion different to traditional civil military relations. See, civil military relation is very simple. The relationship can be good or bad or ugly. It's only a relationship. Right? In our, uh, you know, but whereas fusion is something where you have to live with each other. Whether you like it or not, you have that, you just have no choice. That's the first thing. And the second thing is that when you talk of civil military fusion, your aims and goals are interdependent. <clears throat> your successes are interdependent. You don't have a choice but to succeed for each other. Right? I leave it at that. Right? And uh, the last question, this was? Yes, sir. Due to oh. time constraints. Yeah, yeah, first class. Thanks Thank a you. lot. Uh, I mean, it's very, to be very <laughs> honest. <laughs> Thank you.
Vasan sir, we can't hear you. We can't hear you. <coughs> can't hear you, sir. Sir, unable to hear you, Vasan sir. You should uh, join back again. Uh, in the meanwhile, may I request Kamado Vijay sir to uh, please take on with the concluding remarks and vote of thanks until uh, Kamado Vasan sir joins. <coughs> yeah, one, 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 one minute, Bala. Yeah, sir, thanks a lot uh, to C3S for giving me this opportunity to talk on this subject. To be very honest, this is not a very popular subject. It is not only not a popular subject, it's quite a dry subject also. Right? And, uh, and this is a subject where you don't get material. Uh, that's what I realized. I thought for a subject of this nature, I should get a whole lot of material. I, do, I couldn't even get one single book to re, uh, read. And I couldn't get any references uh, at all. Uh, so I, what I have put across to you is from a very meager uh, resource base. I've, I'm glad that uh, it has stirred minds and I got so many questions. I, there's only the beginning. Uh, many of these questions which have come to your mind have come to my mind also. And if you think I have the answers for them, no. I don't have the answers for them. And all of us have to find the answers for each other. And maybe in trying to find, attempting to try, find those answers, uh, will be the solution. And last but not the least, I, I, I don't lose hope. Let, let me put it why. I, you know, this, uh, whatever I've spoken today is basically given in one of my articles. And some, some time back when I wrote this article, very few people read it. This is one article where very, I got the least uh, read, viewership and readership also. Okay. But despite that, I'll not, uh, feel, you know, put off, because I'm sure so many of you read, will think and speak and do something and say propagate this, because this is something what we need for the future. Thanks a lot once again. Thanks a lot, Vasan sir, for all the uh, thing. I'm sure, I hope before we break off, we can hear your views again. Over, you, over to you, sir. Thank you. Hope you can hear me. Yes, sir. No, I please. just wanted to uh, check if BSR is around. I wanted him to say a few words before we wind up. Yes, he's still around. Yeah, yeah. Please, sir. Please, sir. Raghavan sir, are you there, sir? Sir, Raghavan sir has left the meeting, sir, already. Okay, all right. Then you please go ahead with the rest because that was the message which I wanted to convey. There was some issue with us at that time. Thank you, sir. My now request Commodore Vijay, sir, Executive Director CPS, to deliver the concluding remarks and vote of time. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Bala. Thank you, Sapna. Well, today, very fascinating talk by General Shankar. And I will say in a true, true gunner shot, <laughs> a straight bat batting and firing absolutely right trajectory, right trajectory for all questions as well. What it conveyed to us, MCF or military civil fusion is basically promoting a deep integration of civilian and defense economies and their respective technological and industrial ecosystem put together with a national requirement. Now, this effect, as you highlighted, is intended to create and leverage the synergies between the economic development and the military modernization as well as the R&D institutions put together. What this allows us, it allows to China, and it may allow us tomorrow, the defense and, and commercial and private sector enterprises to collaborate and synchronize their efforts through sharing of R&D, the talent, the resources, and all the technical innovations. He also mentioned, though he went through beautiful slide presentation of necessity, modern approach, the organization which China is following, and what, how it reached the it amount toward a comprehensive national power. He explained to us six facets of MCF, MCF which China has followed. But the more interestingly, 
he summarized how India can follow it and where do we lack. I very honestly put across. I do agree with him. It's once a one topic, not very much talked in the military. We all do whispering about it. We don't talk so openly about it. Well, sir, you mentioned that your first uh, writing very few read, but today we have 76 participants who listen. <laughs> I have that couple of for that. <coughs> I, I saw one uh, slight uh, caption for you. What is required for India? I, in my view, I added two more words in the you say political, civil, military fusion. I added two more words to this. In my experience after one generation after you, that is political, civil, military, bureaucratic, and inspiration or aspirational attitudinal fusion, which is missing yeah. our case, most of cases. I agree with you. So that is what I thought so. Well, it was a very, very interesting uh, talk by General Shankar. I'm sure most of us, the young minds and all the distinguished uh, members, put a thought to it now onwards and see how we can contribute towards this MCF for India. What my duty remains is to thank first Jagan Shankar for taking his time out and making the subject so interesting through his slides and examples. That is more my very first thing. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so Welcome, much. sir. I'd like to press the record. The guidance today we saw our veteran chief, Mr. Rag Sri Raghavan, and with expression to all of us, the age of 94, 95, you are sitting through the presentation and what taking interest. That's what India needs from young minds. Inspiration, aspiration, put together to take this country forward. Atman Nirbharta is not a thought, it's a commitment. From a political masters to a, a man on the ground, be from any institution, any business, military, or any service he is, is a combined effort of national unity, national commitment. I'd like to place on record the thank and guidance to our Director General Commander Watson, who's a leading light for us, who comes out with all the search, research, and new ideas, what has not been covered, what we have not discussed, what we have not shared with the, with the community. Thank you so much, sir, for being with us always and give us and of course, putting both in, uh, trust on us. I'd like to thank all the distinguished members who attended the presentation today and all the online participants, which went to 76 at the top of the number. Thank you very much for being with us. And just to remind you, please put on your reminders. And on 22nd Saturday, we have another interesting uh, program for you. A book conversation on Sino-Russian military pact and implications or India's 11 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. is mark your calendars and do with that. We'll send you the link. I'll be failing my duty if I don't thank <coughs> my team members, Mr. Bala Subramaniam and Sapna, who take the load, put the thought into an action and creating this link, the information campaign, and of course, conducting this webinar. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, everybody, for being with us. Jai Hind. Jai Hind. Thank you, sir.